Thank you, Mallory. It's always fun to be here, though I'm, I'm, uh, it's unusual for me to be on a program with so many politicians. I'm not sure what to make of this. Uh, only Mallory could pull that one off. Inequality. The, according to President Obama last week, this is the issue that defines our era. This is the challenge that we all face. Inequality, according to the left today, is destroying America and is going to be their primary focus. I travel a lot uh, during the year. I speak all over the country, primarily in university campuses. And let me tell you, this is the issue that seems to be concerning academia today. This is the issue that's being discussed on campuses. These are the questions that students are asking every talk that I give. But what about inequality, even from people you wouldn't expect to hear it? This is the issue that today dominates the critique of America, the critique of free markets. And it fits. Our universities are dominated by the left. That's not news, shouldn't be news. I hope it's not news to you guys, to anybody. And the idea of inequality fits to a mentality that believes that economic activity is somehow a zero-sum game, that some people's gain is other people's loss. It's a mentality that doesn't care about economic progress, about economic success, and driven by a, a philosophical attitude that is egalitarianism, the most significant philosophical force today on campuses is John Rawls' voice, the, the, the Harvard philosopher, the idea of egalitarianism. It is the dominant set of ideas out there. They hold, if you will, on campuses the moral high ground. This is, it's on their terms that the debate about, about rights, they don't believe there are any, about econo economics, about freedom, it is on their terms that that debate is, uh, is handled. Now, what, what should we do about it? And I, I think the right, uh, the right lo tends to lose these debates. And the right tends to lose these debates because it won't challenge them at the core. You know, so what's the issue with inequality? Well, to start off with, what's the alternative to inequality? Equality. Anybody see anybody equal out there? Any of you guys equal over there? I mean, equal, you're equal to what? Uh, I mean, there's a big confusion in the right about equality, right? Because in the Declaration, it says all men are created, you know, we're all equal. But in what terms is equality referred to by the founders? Is it equality of outcome? Well, obviously not. Is it equality of opportunity, which Republicans like to talk about? Is it? What opportunity? Really? The founders thought we should all have equal opportunity? They were that delusional? How many of you have equal opportunity? There's no equal opportunity out there. It doesn't exist. What the founders were talking about was equality before the law. We all, all of us have rights. We all have individual rights. We all have a right to our own life. We all have a right to liberty and to the pursuit of our own happiness. That doesn't guarantee outcome, but it doesn't even guarantee opportunity. It guarantees freedom. It guarantees our freedom from coercion. That is the only sense in which equality is a valid concept. Because every other form of equality, equality of opportunity, equality of outcome, requires what? It requires force. It requires coercion. It requires taking from some to give to others. Equality of opportunity. How do we take care of the fact that some of us are born to poor families, some of us are born to rich families, connected families, unconnected families, nice parents, not so nice parents. The only way to equate all that is by, is to try. You can't equate all that. There is no such thing as equality. Equality of outcome of opportunity are metaphysically impossible. They cannot happen. But the attempt to try to equalize necessitates violating some people's individual rights, that is making them less equal before the law, in order to give to other people, therefore making them 
giving them preferential treatment before the law, exactly what the founders were arguing against. What we need is to take the moral high ground, to show equality for what it really is. And I hold, I hold a mental picture for equality of outcome. You, you're telling me to stop without the mental picture? Yeah. Finishing your mental picture. Oh, this is the mental picture to think about equality of outcome. Think Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge. Because the, Cam the Khmer Rouge came back from Paris, by the way, where they studied with good Western philosophers, all influenced by French egalitarians, right? And they came back and they said, look, we want equality. But the people in the cities and people in the countryside, they're not equal, so what do we do? Well, we push everybody out of the cities. But it's still true that some of the people in the cities, that were in the city, or some of the people generally, are smart, and some are not so smart. Some are educated, some not so educated. So what do we do there? Kill all the educated. You laugh, but that meant the killing of two million people out of a population of over five. Almost 40% of the population. That is equality of outcome. How do you make me and Michael Jordan equal in basketball? There's only one way. Cut his leg off, and if you'd watch me play basketball, you'd realize you had to break his arms as well. <laughs> that is what equality means. They're the bad guys. We who don't believe that inequality is a problem are the good guys, and we need to be aggressive in stating that fact. Thank you all. Okay, our first question. Listen to that. You got to even know. Our first question, Mr. Riley. The. Um Conservatives' response to the class warfare argument, as I understand it traditionally, has been to ensure um, mobility, economic mobility. That should be our focus. As long as people can move uh, between classes, no matter how you're born, where you come from, there's the opportunity to move between uh, the classes. That is, is what our focus should be on. The left's argument today, as I understand it, is that A, the inequality is greater than it used to be and that there is less economic mobility. Do either of those arguments have any validity? And if so, what's your response? So do they have any validity? <laughs> you can read a bunch of studies, and there's a, there's a wide spectrum of opinion about this. I tend to be skeptic about the validity regarding the inequality. Um, usually the studies showing that inequality has increased don't take into account things like changes in, uh, in household composition. Um, they also don't take, they're also all, all done pre-taxes, pre-transfer. If you take post-transfer, post-taxes, take into account household size, inequality has not grown in America. It's still too large for the left. Now with regard to immobility, I would say absolutely they're right. Immobility, mobility in, in the U.S. has declined. <laughs> But I would argue, and I think we need to argue, that the reason is statism. The reason is over is regulation. If you, if you need a, shamp, a license to shampoo hair in California, who does that hurt? It hurts the new entrant, the young poor person who's trying to make a living. Minimum wage, this is a huge issue right now. It's all over the place. California just raised it to $10. We have to make the case that A, this is immoral, it's wrong for the state to intervene between a negotiation between employee and employee. It's none of the state's business. And who, who gets hurt? <laughs> who gets hurt? The unskilled laborer gets hurt because he's never going to find a job, learn a skill, advance and be able to, make, to, to move up the ladder in terms of income. But not just him. The, the entrepreneur gets hurt. Somebody who's starting a business and who wants to pay a few people, you know, five bucks an hour. And they're willing to pay, they're willing to come and work for five. He's never going to start that business. That's what is restricting. And let me, last thing. Cronyism. You know, we've got it. You, we've got to acknowledge. You're not leaving anything problem. left for yeah, questions. Okay. Question. <laughs> Somebody Question. asked me about cronyism. You're on. I, 
I am in complete agreement with you on uh, left-wing arguments about equality. In fact, uh, I salute you for my patience. I can barely take them seriously long enough to rebut them. However, what I do find very persuasive is Charles Murray's argument uh, that he began advancing in the bell curve and then elaborated uh, and really focused in on in coming apart uh, about the way in which American society has evolved uh, in the post-war years. And I'll, try to give, I'll try to give a very brief summary. Uh, the rise of the knowledge economy, the rise of automation has uh, uh, increased the value of uh, intelligence. Uh, universities have done a good job of sorting people by intelligence. Uh, intelligent people have associatively mated with each other. They have stable family structures. Lower class people uh, do not. And this has led to a disconnect between the cognitive elite and uh, the working class in America. Uh, is he wrong to worry about that? You're going to be our speaker next time. <laughs> I don't, I think he's wrong. I mean, he's not wrong to worry about it because the context of the world in which we live in today is such that that is going to be used for political means, which is what the left is doing. The fact that there's a huge premium today on talent is unquestionable. The, the, the fact is that education, you, you get paid to be educated, you get paid to be entrepreneurial, you get paid to create value. And that, and that payment because of globalization has only increased, that is economically, the amount of money you make for, for a unit of talent in a globalized world, if you will, is far greater than the amount you would get in an isolationist world where you're just dealing with Americans. They're just more customers for your product so you can make more money. So that has, has, has made the top go up. The only, but you see, in, a, in, a, in my view, in a free market, in a market, in a, in a country that is not driven by a morality of egalitarianism, a, a, a morality of the left, who would care, right? Because everybody's benefiting from these talented people. The, the workers benefit from it. Wages, because of productivity increases, because of all this, would increase. I think what is exacerbating the problem um, that exists is is government, which is not allowing for the for the economy to be as flexible as it should be, as it would be in a free market. Ileana. You mentioned that you think the right is losing uh, on this issue. Uh, it seems to me that uh, the left has a formidable spokesman for the views that you oppose uh, in the president, who just gave a speech about them. Um, can we get your thoughts on um, on the remarks he's made? Um, I think he's given three big speeches on them. And uh, who do you think are the best spokesmen um, for for your views uh, on the right? So I don't. Let me just say that I don't think the left is winning because of the president. I, I don't think it matters who the president is. With all due respect to the politicians in the room, I don't think you're as powerful as you think you are. Uh, I think the left is winning. It's because they dominate our educational institutions. They're winning because they dominate. You know, we get in a sense we get the politicians we deserve in in to a large measure, and it's the people. The people are being educated by primary school teachers, by high school teachers, by university teachers, and they're all, not all, but 80% of them are of the left. Many of them are the radical left. That's what's really dominating this debate. Yes, the president is the spokesman for that group. He's got a huge uh, bully pulpit, but people are responding because they've been already conditioned to that to respond because of the universities, because of the intellectuals. The, the, Unfortunately, the left dominates the intellectual fields uh, with, with obvious exceptions. Now, who are the best voices out there? Obviously, the, you know, we've got one here, uh, uh, Senator Johnson, who I think is a, is a, is a good voice on our, on our right. Uh, we've got <laughs> on economic issues, we've got Rand Paul, we've got Ted Cruz. Um, it, but what I'd like to see from all of them is, is, is I'd like, because we have to combat this at the root. And in order to do that, we have to start making not just practical arguments. I mean, Obamacare now is, is a great example. Is, yes, it's a failure, but they'll fix the website. The point is that Obamacare is immoral. It is a massive redistribution of wealth. It is a perversion of liberty. It is a distortion. And we need to hear more of why and the details of those moral arguments. I think at the end of the day, people don't vote their pocketbook. They vote what they believe is right, what they believe is just, what they believe is fair. We've let the left dominate defining justice, fairness, goodness. And the right needs to recapture or learn to capture those terms uh, from the left. Would you believe he was a professor the way he goes on with us? <laughs> 
Uh, one last question from uh, Jason. Um, you mentioned the minimum wage debate we're having right now, the fast food restaurants, the demonstrations. Um, but you've also got some legislation in both the House and the Senate. The President has endorsed it. Uh, and it's not a necessarily a partisan issue. Minimum wage increase passed under President Bush with Republican support. Uh, you have um, a number of people saying the, our old views of the minimum wage don't apply anymore, that um, it, uh, it puts money in people's pockets, and uh, it doesn't have that big of an effect on employment. Um, has the literature borne out these, uh, this new thinking? that we hear from some on the left about the minimum wage? No. You know, this is Economics 101. We should never even be debating this. This is price controls. The, the effect is obvious. It always is. Anybody's interested, John Cochran from the University of Chicago has a nice little blog post where he summarizes the literature. You know, the left research is nonsense. It really is nonsense. And, you know, you don't repeal the laws of economics through a vote in Congress. And Republicans have voted to increase the minimum wage are reneging on the claim that they believe in markets. If you believe in markets, you cannot vote for an increase in the middle of wage. That is a repudiation of, the, of that belief. Okay, we have time for one quick question. No, I'm sorry, one quick answer. There is no such thing. Okay. Stand up, please. Could I just suggest that perhaps attacking at the roots means we have to take back the universities? We have to take back the... Why do we sit here and... Every meeting I go to, everybody just accepts. It's a given that they, they dominate the educational system. So you know what? We've lost permanently because we don't know what's good for us. Um, I'm not standing still, so absolutely we need to retake the universities. I spent a lot of time in universities debating those leftists, uh, which require a lot of patience. And those crony capitalists. But you have, to, you have to go in the universities. You have to do it. Uh, the Ayn Rand Institute supports professors who teach you know, free markets, whether it's in philosophy departments, whether it's economic departments, whether it's business schools. There are not a lot of them. You guys, you guys have money. Don't give, you want to do one thing to save America? Don't give money to your alma mater. Do not give the money. Find, find some good professors, people who teach the right stuff. Support them. And if your alma mater doesn't have a professor like that, demand that they do. Don't sign a single check until they do. We need, we have to. If, we have, if we're going to save this culture, you've got to take over back the universities. The only way to do that is through the purse strings. Use it. You guys have the purse strings. Don't just write a check because you went there when they're undercutting everything you believe in. That is suicide, which American business is committing every single day. Our, our very unpassionate... Um, what can I do? I don't believe... You're on